Hello, my name is Jane Rohde from JSR Associates. I am here to present to you Resilient Flooring and Materiality, Transparency, Product Service Life, and Performance. This course has been certified by IDCEC and AIA for CES and CEU credit. The learning objectives for this course include providing the process for developing owner project requirements or OPR for flooring products, understand the project conditions for successful flooring installations, and also understanding the material ingredients as well as the product manufacturing process and installation methods for resilient flooring products. The owner project requirements are the part of the design process that we know as the planning and programming section in the overall design process that sets the stage for what happens during the rest of the design phases. In describing the information included in the evaluation of owner project requirements, sometimes referred to as program requirements, and in healthcare, the functional programming process. This is different than understanding the overall physical space requirements and adjacencies. This process comes before the physical space requirements are completed and established. This process allows for all the goals to be established on a high level and subsequently on the detailed level. Product determinations and the specific requirements to successfully operate the built environment based upon the owner's needs. This could include flexibility in some spaces, while others require very specific detailed specifications that need to be adhered to to meet the goals and the performance requirements that are part of the project. We find that balancing criteria for selection includes evaluating those product performance characteristics in conjunction with the sustainability and health and wellness goals. Appropriate product for the application is essential, particularly when you're looking at different types of settings and their requirements to make sure that you're meeting exactly what the owner is anticipating. Aesthetics, of course, as designers, this is very important, and this is a large portion of what we're doing in terms of design. But we also want to make sure that the aesthetics are balanced with the product performance characteristics and the type of installation. Maintenance considerations, including of cleaning and disinfection, particularly in light of COVID-19, is also another consideration and has different discussion points because of the pandemic. Cost is a part and budgeting of materials is always a part of the selection process. Owner project requirements will be different for a healthcare project that has different types of requirements for flooring. As an example, this medical center may be a 24 seven operation to be able to provide dining and food service to three shifts of employees from varying backgrounds. Evaluation of the cleaning and disinfection protocols for a healthcare facility will be in place for healthcare settings and is within the Center for Disease Control and Prevention recommendations for COVID-19, healthcare cleaning and disinfection is recommended for all other types of settings as well. This reduces surface contamination and potential indirect transmission of SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus responsible for COVID-19. Understanding this process is threefold in terms of looking at what needs to be evaluated. One is the efficacy of the products that are used for cleaning and disinfection. This is identified through EPA list N, which has the registered products that are available that will kill the envelope virus, which is fairly easy to kill. The second part of that is making sure that the environmental services staff are using the appropriate chemistries as well as following manufacturer recommendations, but also using the least caustic chemical combination to kill the virus to also reduce any exposure to the environmental services or end users. The third component is making sure and verifying that the disinfection chemicals that are used on a product will not create a degradation to that product. So those are the three components in evaluation and conversations that need to happen when you're talking with the owner and establishing project requirements. We compare this healthcare setting with the renovation of a historic structure in this church that has different requirements regarding use and aesthetic, as well as being able to be maintained as a high traffic space, but with intermittent building users versus a 24 seven application. The types of events range from smaller gatherings to larger celebrations, and depending upon humanitarian need, could be transformed into a space to sort food or supplies during an emergency, or in, in this case, the pandemic. 
So first, in terms of establishing your OPR, the creation of a multidisciplinary team approach is critical. Evaluating and including all the stakeholders provides an opportunity to glean information that will allow the design environment to support the functions and operations occurring in each space. At some points, the criteria may be at odds, such as certain aesthetic within a lobby, but the need to address high traffic issues in all types of weather conditions. These, this goes back to our balance of criteria information and the need to balance what you're asking and what the performance characteristics are of a product. These types of conversations happening at the beginning of the project brings about collaborative decision making that that framework can then carry through the overall project and can result in meeting both goals once the stakeholders all understand the needs. So what are some of the questions that we would ask during operational programming is do you have a standard developed for specifying flooring products? What is the wear layer based on the traffic level that's going to be utilized within a space? What is the desired aesthetic of the overall project and how can we accomplish some of that through the specification of flooring products? And who are the end users of the product and the project? So in this case with the educational side, yes, it's children, but it's also the staffing and the various administration in addition to the teachers themselves. Additional questions include, what is the anticipated product service life? So what do we mean by that? The product service life is established in terms of how long the client is anticipating that that product is going to last within their space. And depending on the sector also often depends on what the service life needs to be. So for example, in long-term care, which is one of our specialties in terms of design, when we evaluate that, we look at a product that could last between 10 and 15 years because senior living is a very tight budget focused industry because of the reimbursement rates. Whereas you look at healthcare, it may be a little bit shorter. It might be a seven to 10 year, but then you also have the combination of that and looking at how frequently do you replace flooring products? Because other corporations may actually have a replacement schedule that doesn't, isn't tied to the product service life like you would have in other settings. So this could be true in hospitality, this could be true in workplace, this could be true in other verticals. So when you're looking at that, you want to establish the length of time that that product is anticipated to hold up and be durable enough to perform correctly for the owner. One of the other questions that we talk about often with facilities folks is how much attic stock do you maintain for current project and for other projects? And not only the attic stock, but the type of product may indicate the type of storage that you have, how they're maintained and how that attic stock needs to be stored so that you make sure that you have an adequate amount, but you also have the capability of being able to store it, tag it and know where it is from an organizational perspective. So that's a good conversation to have with the facilities group. So receiving information and having dialogue with the environmental services technicians and management is also critical. If flooring types are specified that are different than those currently installed, or there isn't familiarity with the maintenance processes for different types of resilient flooring being specified, it is important to discuss and verify that the different types of maintenance needs can be provided for the different flooring types. For example, VCT differs from cleaning and disinfection from other materials such as vinyl sheet or cork or rubber flooring products, all of which have different maintenance processes. From a repair perspective, some materials may be easier to complete in-house repairs than others. That should be noted to have that conversation with the facilities group. This may impact the specifier's recommendations based upon the expectation of the owner and the related facility staff. So if there is any concerns in terms of maintenance or previous product installations, things that they've had issues with, you want to understand those so that you can solve those for the product. Additional questions include, do you have any transition issues between different flooring product types? And this often can be from carpet to LVT or from vinyl floorings, resilient to resilience or to tile, but basically understanding if there's any issues ahead of time. So you can start to talk about those and solve those issues through the design process. Establishing the budget for not just flooring, but other finishes is really important so that you understand where your, your product service life has to meet the budget. And so those are all def def definitely questions that we would wanna ask and discuss. You also want to ask about the project sustainable priorities and are you striving in terms of the client to achieve a certification from a green building rating system? Evaluating the technical data that you need as a designer, but also the information that the owner needs and facilities department needs in order to maintain the products 
So do you hire sustainable product certifications for flooring products? This could be like floor score, which addresses indoor air quality. It could also be NSF 332, which is the multi-attribute standard from NSF that includes various topics within sustainability, health and wellness, and social responsibility as part of the certification system from a multi-attribute perspective. This could include environmental product declarations. It could include health, health product declarations and realizing that you wanna understand what the product and the sustainability piece is in conjunction with and in evaluation with the performance of durability. Also looking at it, we cannot have the conversation without talking about COVID and has COVID-19 created any additional considerations for the flooring specification for the owner. This could have to do with wayfinding. It could be have to do with uh, separating circulation. And these, these items may be temporary or they may be permanent. If they're going to be permanent in terms of rerouting people and evaluating things from a different perspective, because this may not be the last time and is anticipated not to be the last time that a pandemic could occur. So therefore that conversation could actually impact how you specify, but also how you lay out and design your flooring products. I wanted to tie the owner project requirements also to the overall performance testing requirements. So ASTM F06.20 on test methods gives you the various types of test methods that are used for all types of resilient flooring products. So this is a floating LVT example, and I wanted to show and highlight the resistance to chemicals. So the ASTM F92513 standard test method for resistance to chemicals of resilient flooring is a test method that provides a procedure for determining the resistance of resilient floor covering to surface deterioration when exposed to various chemical reagents. This goes back to our third bullet point of understanding what happens to the surface when a chemical is applied to it. This test method is intended as a staining, not a staining test, nor as a method to judge surface and appearance restoration of the sample after exposure to the chemical reagent. So this provides, I know from the talking with the various technical advisory committee members of RFCI, Resilient Floor Covering Institute, that people have started looking at this um, in light of COVID-19, but also to better understand what chemistries can be used uh, for cleaning and disinfection that can then be provided to the designer as well. The other part of the a very important part uh, is understanding the project conditions. And that includes no matter what type of resilient flooring product is installed, the subfloor preparation is key to a successful installation. You will find this reinforced throughout the program for each resilient floor type that's reviewed. And the preparation involves measuring the moisture content in concrete slabs and selecting a condition appropriate adhesive for the installation. There are two test methods, anhydrous calcium chloride, which is surface water vapor emission that has a different test method from ASTM versus the relative humidity test, which drills into the subfloor, utilizes an electric electronic probe and determines percentage of moisture that utilizes a, a different test method as well. In talking to various technical people and talking to various manufacturers, it does seem to be best practice to do both tests because they test things slightly differently as well as in different locations. Therefore, in terms of cost, it is not a substantial amount of additional monies to require both tests to be due to be completed when you're doing your subfloor preparation and including that in your specifications. We also want you to reference the flooring product manufacturer recommendations as part of the conversation. Calculating relative humidity levels allows for the identification of the most appropriate adhesives to be used based upon site conditions. Can't reinforce this more that you really need to know the appropriate application. For example, many standard flooring adhesives are rated to withstand up to 80% relative humidity, but if resilient flooring products were to be installed in a more humid environment, a different flooring product or moisture mitigation solution would need to be specified that could withstand conditions including higher relative humidity. The recommendation is to always reference a specific product manufacturer's recommendations for that recommended adhesive based upon the site conditions. So we reinforce that three times. The other part of successful installation in addition to flooring product manufacturers installation specification requirements and recommendations is working with the general contractor to verify the qualifications and training of finished subcontractors. There is a specification available at the link from install floors Install is an organization that does training and education of flooring installers. 
And I think that this is a very important part of the design process because we all know that the final installation reflects on all of us, including the designer. So I'd like to show you this short video that provides an overview of the types of training that is available through install and other similar types of vocational programs. For designers, it demonstrates the importance of knowing the qualifications of the flooring and finished subcontractors working on a project. So this shows some of the training, but also the complication and complicated complex installations, right? Cutting circles, being able to do curves, doing the things that designers may often want. In addition to understanding the detailing of Cove Base and how to install various types of products so it's successful. This is a very important process for both the flooring manufacturer as well as the designer. This detail that's shown here on the right is an installation photo that's a, that includes LVT and carpet with a smooth transition that does not use a bumper or speed bump type of transition. From a design perspective, this is very important for mobility, cart traffic, strollers, et cetera. As a matter of practice for successful installation, pre-construction meetings with a general contractor are another recommendation. So what we find is that if we have that meeting in the very beginning of the process, and then we also have the finished subcontractors meeting, that the contractors start to, to understand why you're specified what you specified. And in, in a sense, creating a communication plan, realizing that the contract is between the general contractor and the subcontractor, but creating a relationship so that the subcontractor can come back to the general to talk to the designer to understand better about what the intent is, or if they have a question on the installation, they can handle that. And I think that that's a very important part of the communication overall. And if you have your general contractor as part of your multidisciplinary team in the beginning of setting your OPR up, which is what we recommend, then that allows you to be able to also have that relationship built throughout the project process. And so when people see different kinds of detailing or why it's important, so if you're doing a cove base in an educational setting because it's easier for cleaning and disinfection, that's something that you can explain why to the subcontractor. That often helps to get that process done and, and get the installation uh, completed the way it needs to be, but you're there and, and available as a resource for that subcontractor. Welding sheet products, there's two different ways in terms of welding sheet products together, cold and chemical welding and hot heat welding. There is a reference uh, for the inclusion within specifications that talks about these types of conditions. And it's important to realize that that would be information that should be shared and understood and what it means. So some chemical welding products for sheet vinyl are two parts, but some are one part. The weld chemically fuses two adjacent sheets through a reaction caused by the seam sealer and the two adjacent sheets of vinyl. So that would be cold or chemical welding. Whereas hot, hot or heat welding uses the bead and the equipment shown in these photos. The other matter of practice is when we look at universal design from a accessibility perspective, we want to also realize that the translation through a product from the subfloor and what can transfer through to the surface of the finished floor can occur if the smooth and 
looking at the evaluation of flash patching and doing smooth transitions is not completed on the subfloor level. So in an existing facility completely that's being renovated, this often can be a bigger issue than it is in new construction, but we've also seen it in new construction where the subfloor prep needs to be completed so that you don't translate anything through from the subfloor through the surface of the material. So this is part again of not just smooth transitions, but a matter of practice of subfloor preparation. So universal design in the past has been equated with accessibility, but in consideration of the University of Buffalo's Center for Inclusive Design and Environmental Access, the IDEA Center, the definition is also about access to amenities, services, and community. So from a built environment perspective, as a designer that works on inclusive environments, the goal to support independence for all building users can be impacted on how flooring comes together. And the goal is to create a smooth transition between materials to foster all the types of mobility that you may have, but also cart traffic, material mothers with strollers, movement of materials, delivery of groceries, all types of materials management is all beneficial to having a universal design approach. And so we're seeing this more and more in supportive environments throughout. So this is different than ADA. It's different than talking about things just from ANSI 117 from an accessibility perspective. This talks about giving people access and increasing their independence and their opportunity to move freely through spaces. And as designers, we can definitely impact that in a positive way. This is a smooth transition that is a demonstration of doing carpet and LVT uh, together. And using again, the right subfloor preparation and use of transitions with various types of transition strips, welding techniques and underlayment materials, the height variations can be accommodated that maximize the usefulness of the space. There is a rubber underlayment in this case that was used for acoustic benefit and underfoot comfort. Two different mill thicknesses to accommodate the carpet and LVT smooth transition between the spaces were used. We used two millimeters under the carpet and five millimeters under the LVT. When using vinyl and rubber materials together, it's also important to verify the compatibility with the manufacturer of the relevant product. So for example, a sheet product doesn't do as well when you're trying to do a separate underlayment. We have found that the underlayment had to be part and integral to the product in the sheet vinyl uh, so that we could also make the smooth transitions between the LVT and carpet. You don't necessarily have to have an underlayment to do this, but we wanted to try this, this as an application because we were looking at also addressing the acoustic benefit as well as the underfoot comfort in the project. So the other thing is the details. I think this is one of the most beautiful details I've ever seen in terms of the installation of a coved base. Knowing and understanding those details as discussed and included with the owner project requirements is a critical part of creating a flooring system that will meet the product life cycle expectations of the owner. For areas that require infection control and high level of disinfection, which we're seeing more and more because of COVID-19 and recommendations from the CDC, a cove base detail would be recommended that we also often find in healthcare spaces. Whereas for other types of commercial spaces, fully adhered separate wall base may be the appropriate product, which we utilize a lot as well. Sometimes we set that in a bead on the, on the edge. Uh, so when we do the installation to create a good sealed edge between the separate base and the product itself. So we're gonna cover resilient flooring types. The following provides information on materials as well as various types of materials, including performance criteria, production explanations, construction of products, installation and advantages. The first product type we're going to evaluate are vinyl products that are part of the resilient flooring family. I wanted to show this to you because I don't think many designers may even know that vinyl actually comes predominantly from salt. And salt is actually mined and it doesn't come from seawater or other resources. It's actually mined in its a mound of salt that has developed naturally. They use hot water extraction actually to mine the salt that is used. So in, in terms of evaluating products, that's one of the reasons that Louisiana and the Gulf Coast is, has PVC plants in it is because it has these mounds of salt that are then used for mining mined and they're used to create and, and evaluate the product types for developing chlorine and the byproduct of caustic. Caustic is then used, even though it is a byproduct, but it's used for in the industri industrial chemistry world as well as in the building products world and is an ingredient in many different things. 
So it's good to understand that the byproducts are all used. So when salt is separated into caustic and chlorine, both products are, are utilized and uh, in process. So chlorine is a basic raw material and is used for various different types of things in terms of water treatment and pharmaceuticals and the like. And then from natural gas, ethylene is, is created from the natural gas when it's separated. So chlorine and ethylene come together to create vinyl chloride monomer. The monomer is then put together in a PVC resin polymerization process. That's where PVC resin comes from. PVC resin is, can be in pellets, it can be in powders, it can be in different formulations. And then it's combined in the compounding process with fillers, additives, modifiers, stabilizers, and plasticizers. It then, if you're looking at it from a flooring perspective, you would also have different specialty top coats. So there are rigid flooring products that are applications that are vinyl that we will cover, as well as flexible vinyl applications that we will also cover. We're gonna start with vinyl composition tile as the product type. And for performance, vinyl composition tile has a ASTM F1066 is the performance standard. So there's a performance standard for each type of resilient flooring that I think is good for everyone to be aware of so that when you're looking at those performance characteristics, you can also see what the performance is and what the methodology that's utilized for that performance. And I think understanding that better also provides us insights as to what the best product for the application is. So when we're looking at the production of VCT, there's two lines, one called the model line, which is those little chips that, that are made up that, that go into the final product. And then the mixture, overall mixture that creates the product itself and in which that is then has an application of a finish and then is punch pressed into usually squares, 12 by 12 squares is what we're most commonly known, but there are other shapes as well. Uh, so v VCT is a mixture of natural limestone, filler materials, thermoplastic binder, and color pigments. It's made by fusing those chips into solid sheets. So it's that model line process of, of the chips that then is included into the solid sheets and cutting them into tiles. VCT requires layers of polish to protect its porous surface because it's predominantly limestone is the main ingredient that is utilized in VCT. So when you look at the actual construction of VCT, it has the durable through pattern PVC wear layer and then a coating that is utilized to resist scratching and chemical resistance. Installation, although composition tile is a little bit thicker than some products, it is still just as important to make sure that the subfloor is is smooth and is ready for installation in terms of all the things we talked about under the project condition section. So advantages of vinyl composition tile include the modular flexibility. It does have large format shapes, sizes, and colors. It is a through pattern product, which means that when you have something happen at a surface, it still is all the way through the product in terms of the patterning and the design. It withstands heavy foot and rolling traffic and many products include a factory finish. It has a very reasonable first cost, which is why it is often specified, particularly for budgets that are incredibly tight. The next product category we're gonna discuss is homogeneous sheet vinyl. Sheet vinyl from a performance perspective is evaluating through ASTM F1913. So this is the performance uh, methodology that would want to be evaluated in terms of the test methods. In terms of production, it is, it is a sheet product so that basically you are mixing everything together, going through the extruder, creating, going through the granulator, and then that is then utilized as part of a scattering process in the sheet, sheet vinyl production. It goes through a temper machine, which does have the heating part of that uh, element and then it creates the sheet flooring then the sheet flooring is rolled and then boxed and ready to go. Sometimes it's it's shipped also just being wrapped because it is in a in a sheet format. Uh, some a terminology issue that I want to just bring about is where it says relaxation and lacquering. Lacquering is something that is utilized more in Europe and the UK. 
in the US that may be a terminology called urethane that you may be familiar with or wear layer. So when you see those term terms, those are somewhat interchangeable in terms of what we're talking about. So that's the terminology that's used in Europe. Some of these diagrams have come from ERFME, which is the uh, European version of the Resilient Floor Covering Institute, and they have production diagrams that we utilize as a basis for these diagrams. Therefore, we kept the same consistent nomenclature of lacquering throughout, but urethane and wear layer are two other terms that are utilized for this. It's a through pattern PVC wear layer that is part of the sheet itself, and then it has specialty top coats. The installation considerations that govern vinyl sheet products do not vary significantly from homogeneous to heterogeneous, but there are some subtle nuances. When heat welding, homogeneous vinyl is less sensitive to heat and therefore has more tolerance from showing scorch or burn marks if heat welded incorrectly. Homogeneous vinyl may provide slightly lower margin of error for subfloor prep though, because of no patterns or embossing, which you do have in, in heterogeneous there is a greater propensity to telegraph imperfections in the subfloor. The smoother and more monochrome the vinyl is, the more it shows imperfections in the subfloor. So again, reinforcing that that's really important. You can also see the level of detail. So when you're really cutting and, and verifying how the installation is going to occur, homogeneous sheet vinyl as on any sheet would really require a lot of attention to detail and making sure that it's installed correctly. Various advantages for homogeneous is through color construction provides even wear and a consistent appearance over time. It is very durable under heavy rolling loads and seams can be heat welded. The product can be flash cove for more efficient cleaning, which is consistent with other sheet products as well. So heterogeneous flooring is basically the layer, a layered process. It has a different performance standard, ASTM F1303, and it has a different type of production method. So plastisol, which is a liquid mixture of PVC, uh, dispersion of PVC resin, plasticizers and fillers and additives that has a consistency of a paste. The paste or plastisol is applied by a coating process and transformed into, into the solid state by heating. This is called jellification in the diagram shown. And so heterogeneous can also be calendared, similar to homogeneous sheet vinyl, but this gives you an opportunity to see that there's multiple layers that come together that are put into the product. And you'll see that in the construction diagram. So there's a fiberglass reinforced base in, in some heterogeneous products. There's also this performance layer that gives you the visual and the texture, the designer printed visual. So this is the technology has done some great things for the vinyl industry because of being able to get these great high resolution digital printed visuals. And so then a specialty top coat would then go over that, that as well. So there are a variety of structures. This diagram is representative of one of the heterogeneous sheet vinyl flooring structures. Some do not include the designer printed visual layer, and there are those with and without some type of backing cloth. So it's just good to know that this is an example of the construction, but you can see that it's multi-layered versus homogeneous. That is a single layer with a top coat. The installation considerations that govern the vinyl sheet products like we talked about for heterogeneous it, it does not, it is not as for heat welding is more sensitive to heat. So it has less tolerance uh, so compared to where, what you would have with homogeneous. Heterogeneous vinyl may provide slightly higher margin of error for sub pour prep because it is embossed and the patterns are inherent to the vinyl. So it has a greater propensity to not telegraph the imperfections as you would have with homogeneous in the sub pour. So we know that the, the texture helps basically in terms of evaluating any, anything that might be a problem or an imperfection in the subfloor from coming through and telegraphing. So the technological advancements with not only authentic wood and stone visuals, but you also have other abstracts and other types of patterning that are utilized. Uh, the technology advancements have really allowed these products to be much more attractive in terms of just the, the aesthetics and the variety of aesthetics, I think is really the point. It is available in wide widths for seamless installation. It has seamless flooring with uh, excellent top-down moisture protection. It comes in both loose lay and direct glue down installation. 
and it really is beautifully responsible. Solid vinyl tile is, is another category, although others fall within some of the same ASDM methods, just in a different method or class. So solid vinyl performance is ASTM F1700 in class one. So there's two ways that you can make uh, solid vinyl tile. One is the homogeneous sheet calendaring, calendaring that we showed you earlier for the sheet product. And that sheet product is then cut into squares and into tiles. So that's how you, one way of doing production for solid vinyl tile. Another production method is actually to start out with knowing that you're going to make it into tiles and it's actually put into molds. And so the molds are utilized to be able to create the tiles themselves. They are still cut, but they are a thicker piece that comes out. That thicker piece is split and that front part of the split when you're splitting it apart is actually the finished portion of the tile that is shown. So it basically is a different type of method in terms of evaluating how you make it, in terms of making it directly into tiles. And so the molds are then calendared similarly. There is a, a heat uh, process that they go through and then the product is actually cut in two. And that, that thickness allows the product to then be evaluated for the finished surface to be the part that is cut. So basically where the cut split is, that's the surface that is the finished surface for the solid vinyl tile. There's through pattern solid vinyl tile and it, it's simply that with usually with not an additional coating. The installation considerations that govern solid vinyl tile, it's similar to vinyl sheet products, but there's less weight to manage because of the smaller sizes of the tiles, which can range in various sizes. It's the best of both worlds in many ways. Solid vinyl tile has similar product construction properties and, and weight in terms of the product itself in terms of the sheet vinyl. So it's lighter than VCT and it doesn't have a, a wax requirement that's utilized. It's flexible so it can also be coved and welded. So similar to the sheet vinyls that you saw for both heterogeneous and homogeneous. It's easier to create floor pattern designs without having to do water jet cutting because you have smaller format pieces to utilize. Um, and, but it can be if it needs to be. So that has both options. And there is a perception of easy replacement of tiles because it, it can be replaced a tile at a time versus looking at it from an overall sheet perspective. Through color construction provides even wear and a consistent appearance over time is one advantage. It can be heat welded and coved into base, even though it's in a smaller format, and it performs under heavy rolling loads. Our next area that we're going to go over in terms of resilient flooring type is LVT or luxury vinyl tile or LVP, which is luxury vinyl plank. They're the most popular type of vinyl tile flooring. The appeal includes the versatility of various aesthetics that are available to the advancement of the technology that we talked about earlier. So within the digital market, you can create all types of looks. Wood is probably the most common that we all know and stone and other natural materials aesthetics are also part of that. For those that prefer the materiality itself to be represented in the product, an opportunity for a stray of dark light patterning or abstracts represent, but do not directly imitate textiles or materials that are natural materials. So there are three classes within ASTM F1700 standard and vinyl tile and plank for LVT and LVP are in class three solid vinyl floor tile when you're looking at performance information. Understanding the application of the product and the performance needs not only in healthcare environments as shown in this photo, but throughout all types of settings is critical. This is the example of the production where you can see there's many layers, the top layer, the print film, the core layer, the underlayment, and how it comes together, goes through the heating process and creates sheeting, sheet flooring that is then cut into various types of tiles. So there's many layers. There's also a glue down version as well as a loose lay version, a flexible luxury vinyl tile. And so when we look at that, it has a PVC foundation layer, the print film for the realistic visuals, and this has a performance way layer, and that's how the textures and durability are, are added to the product. And then specialty types of coatings that are on the top. 
For loose lay, this is slightly different. It has an anti-slip layer allowing installation without adhesive and easy removal and replacement. There is opportunity sometimes that you may have to have some adhesive on the edges of the floor to start the product, but the goal is for it not to be uh, adhesive used, but to literally be loose lay. The vinyl backing for high pressure resistance, it has a fiberglass veil to minimize expansion and contraction, a middle vinyl layer for extra stability and support, and then a design layer for creating visuals and textures. And then of course, the transparent wear layer that's on top. I love the fact that this picture is a pre-revolutionary building and it's a mill, it was in an old mill. It was used to make carriages. And so when they reinvented the space, they used LVT as a component for durability while still preserving the look and the feel of the old redeveloped mill building. It's been 50 years since the building had been occupied so you want to acclimate uh, to the installation location, humidity and temperature level before installing LVT that is expected for the finished space. Separate into small piles of LVT planks. So you wanna be very aware of that when you're getting ready and part of your specification to understand what is the pre-treatment of the product as well as the subfloor treatment to make sure that everything is, is aligned and ready to go for, the, for a su successful installation. Glue down installation methods involves the use of an adhesive to adhere your dryback luxury vinyl flooring to the subfloor. Using adhesive creates dimensional stability that ensures the flooring maintains its natural characteristics. The glue down method includes two distinct types of adhesive, hard set and pressure sensitive. Hard set is adhesive is spread along on the floor and the flooring is laid on top. Pressure sensitive is the flooring product has adhesive on it and it is bonded to the substrate with pressure. For loose lay flexible luxury vinyl tile can be installed over existing floor coverings, which is one of the advantages as well. Vinyl flooring adhere to the edges of a subfloor, then additional planks and tiles are typically laid in place without an adhesive. Loose lay can easily be removed and replaced. This makes loose lay tile an ideal option for areas where flooring may be temporary or have a short lifespan. It allows you to do the replacements and will not damage the substrate, but also the flooring product. So you could reuse the flooring material. Loose lay is ideal for raised excess floors. There are some restrictions to this as well, but for the most part, loose lay LVT can easily be installed over most raised access floors, especially those that may require frequent access. Loose lay has a higher sound rating than traditional LVT. When traditional LVT typically will not contribute significantly to sound reduction, loose lay LVT is a thicker product with a textured back that offers improved sound testing results, helpful in corporate, multifamily, or other hospital, hospitality installations. Loose lay can butt up to thicker products as well. At five millimeters, loose lay tile can butt directly up to a number of thicker products that would normally require a transition as indicated in our smooth transition section above. Substrate, substrate, scrub straight. Loose lay LVT is only as good as the substrate is installed over and the insulation practices used to install it. So advantages include larger format re reduces the pattern repeat that is available. Digital capabilities with all the, the amazing finishes and looks and aesthetics that we have with LVT. And it has design versatility with the sizing and the aesthetic options with durable finish for, for various applications. So you may find that certain applications may not be appropriate for loose lay versus glue down and glue down is the more appropriate product to utilize. So understanding what the, the requirements are and then evaluating the product type and the product that you're gonna specify accordingly. There are two types of rigid core flooring, SPC, which is stone plastic or polymer composite, and WPC, wood plastic or polymer composite. The ASTM standard for this for performance is ASTM F3261. And it is important that you realize that the product has performance characteristics and evaluating them like the other products that we discussed. I also wanted to point out that when we say luxury vinyl tile, one of my technical guys pointed out to me that luxury is a descriptor used for vinyl tile and planks for both flexible as well as rigid core, understanding that it is a descriptor uh, and, and it doesn't have a technical connection to the product itself. So both products are durable and stable. However, SPC luxury vinyl tile and planks is more durable and denser overall due to its limestone composition. Both work well in commercial interior spaces. WPC is softer and quieter underfoot. 
while SPC offers better resistance from scratches or dents. So understanding your owner project requirements are very important when you evaluate which to use, SPC or WPC. There's not much of an installation method difference between SPC and WPC LVT, but there's an important distinction between what the installations are and how they are applied. For instance, an intended click together LVT is similar for SPC and WPC, and if some adhesive is used, the installation should not fully adhere a floating floor. Typically, loose lay is intended not to have adhesive, but some installations may require a partial adherence in a commercial application. But again, if full adherence is required, the product should be changed to use a fully adhered installation. A non-click vinyl plank for a commercial installation does not click together as the edges are butted. <clears throat> So advantages when you're looking at rigid core luxury vinyl tile and plank, locking systems enable floating installations for residential and light commercial applications. There's no telegraphing of minor subfloor irregularities and it can go over other existing floorings. Resistance to humidity and temperature variations and it can be installed over most of different hard surfaces, including ceramic tile. You wanna verify that the underlayment and whatever other product is installed is is, is in place, um, that there aren't any deficiencies that are gonna cause a problem for the installation of the rigid core. However, this opportunity to be able to not have any telegraphing through the product is very important as a, as a advantage for that product. For rubber is our next category that we're going to discuss. So natural rubber comes from plantations. Synthetic rubber or SBR or SR comes from crude oil or natural gas for ethylene, styrene, butadiene. For the mining portion of it, you do have fillers that are mined in sulfur. When you compound and cure that, you mix that with the fillers, with the natural rubber or the synthetic rubber. Most floorings are made from synthetic rubber, sulfur, and additives. You do the optional coating for flooring because all rubber does not have a coating. And you can create flooring and many other types of products within, within that from that compounded rubber. The ASTM standards that are utilized are rubber sheet flooring ASTM F1859 or 1860. And basically the difference is, is that 1859 is rubber flooring without backing and 1860 is with backing. Rubber tile is, is, has its own ASTM test methodology, ASTM F1344 for, for performance. This production line looks at uh, rubber in terms of how it is made. It is also a calendared product and, and it's vulcanized through a process. The vulcanization process also includes adding heat to that and is then calendared into uh, sheet flooring and the sheet flooring is then uh, can be cut into tiles if it's, it's rubber tile or it can be left in sheet form. So rubber tile usually has an optional polyurethane layer, but it's vulcanized rubber composition includes speckles, chips, or granulated rapidly renewable surface materials, depending on the product composition. There is also a sheet product that it would be similar. It's very similar to what you have, except it's in sheet form instead of in tile form. Another one to evaluate is also that you can have backing. So the prior slide shows it without backing and the current slide shows it with backing. So what are the advantages to rubber tile and sheet? Strong, tough, and durable. It's water resistant. It has excellent slip resistance. Acoustically, it is quiet underfoot and also prom promotes underfoot comfort. It also can be heat welded with integral coat base like other types of sheet products that we have already discussed. would like to show you this restoration of rubber uh, technology because I think it's important to understand what happens to a product once it's installed for many years and is it possible to restore it and bring it back to its, its original uh, performance as well as aesthetic. In this RHC technical video, we'll demonstrate restoration maintenance of a textured rubber tile floor. For this video, we're demonstrating on a floor installed about 10 years ago and has many coats of old acrylic floor finish and combined with soil, gives the flooring a yellow appearance. Unlike some other resilient flooring materials like VCT, 
Rubber flooring does not need a floor finish. We'll be removing the finish and not reapplying. We are using Excelsior PR930 Performance Finish Remover mixed at a ratio of 32 ounces to a gallon of water. PR930 is a finish remover specifically designed to remove topically applied acrylic floor finishes from resilient flooring products that are sensitive to alkalinity, such as rubber flooring. Apply a liberal amount of the diluted PR930 with a sprayer. Allow the solution to dwell for 10 to 15 minutes to emulsify the finish. It's important to not allow the diluted chemical to dry on the flooring. Using a rotary floor machine with a Malgrit scrub brush attachment, scrub the floor in an overlapping circular pattern to help achieve an even scrub across the flooring material. We're using a brush today because this rubber flooring is textured. Brushes perform better than traditional floor pads on textured flooring as the pads do not get down into the valleys of the texture. Note that the floor will be very slick with the emulsified finish, and this can be dangerous for anyone walking on the solution. So wet floor signs and blocking off the area is critical. Use a wet vacuum to remove the slurry. In tight spaces, it may be necessary to use a squeegee to move the solution inward in order for it to be removed with the wet vacuum. Do not allow the solution to dry, as you will need to restart if it does. If the flooring material is still soiled or has residual finish, repeat the process. It's not uncommon to have to perform the scrubbing process more than once in a restoration or stripping situation. Once the floor is completely dry and cool, use the white Tampico brush or equivalent to dry buff the floor to achieve the natural shine that is desired. This allows you to see that rubber tile and it can be restored back, but also the fact of that longevity and product service life that we talked about earlier, that you can actually have a product that's 10 years old that can then be restored back to another 10 years worth of durability. Again, we look at the subfloor and wanting to know that those job site conditions and subfloor prep are critical, and we know that this is successful for this installation. You'll see one photo there that actually is, is stripping off and scraping off all of the old adhesive that was on a flooring that was previously installed to get that back down to a smooth substrate before installing rubber tile and sheet or any other resilient product. Our next section that we're gonna discuss is cork as a resilient flooring type. So the cork tree and the cork bark from the tree is granulated into cork and the processing and curing process of granulated cork and polyurethane binder coupled with the polyurethane finish creates flooring that's cork tile. Cork sheet would be something that you would use for bowls and boards as a tack surface and things like that, also used as an underlayment sometimes for flooring. The ASTM performance standard for cork tile flooring is ASTM F3008. So just about every tree has an outer layer of cork, but the cork oak is the primary source of most cork products in the world, including wine bottle stoppers. These trees primarily grow in countries that run along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, where there's plenty of sunshine, low rainfall, and a high humidity. The countries that produce the most cork include Portugal, Algeria, Spain, Morocco, France, Italy, and Tunisia. A cork oak must be at least 25 years old before its bark can be harvested. Its cork can then be stripped every eight to 14 years after for that as long as the tree lives. The cork is stripped off during June, July, and August using a long handled hatchet to cut sections out of the bark. These sections are then pried away from the tree. Workers must be careful not to damage the inner layer of the bark, otherwise the bark won't grow back. So it's basically a, a regenerating tree, if you will. After the cork is brought from the tree, the cork slabs that are cut away from the tree are boiled and the rough outer layer of the bark is stripped away. Boiling the cork also softens it, making it easier to work with. So that where it says cork stoppers, punching bottle stoppers. From the slabs of cork, holes are punched out to make bottle stoppers. This leaves the slabs full of holes. 
These bottle stoppers are then sorted and shipped to various destinations, and the stoppers can at this time be printed or branded with names or logos, which you would see often on a wine bottle cork. Uses for the scrap cork include the, the leftover scrap to be used ground up, molded into large blocks and baked in ovens to make other cork products, such as cork tile flooring and cork message boards, which would be done in sheet. Cork has been used as bottle stoppers for more than 400 years. It is possibly the best suited material to use as a bottle stopper because it contains a natural waxy substance called suberin. This substance makes cork impermeable to liquids and gas and prevents the cork from rotting, which is why it is used in the wine industry. So as we look at the uh, opportunity to see what the production looks like, so you have cork sheet, which is, can also be used for underlayment uh, under other types of floors or cork flooring. It is boiled as we discussed, and then the scraps from the cork stoppers go in with a polyurethane binder to make a cork sheet. The difference for cork tiles is that it's actually placed in molds, and these molds are then sliced and blocks from the blocks and finished. Then they're cut into tiles and they're packaged for shipping. So this homogeneous cork, which is a direct glue down, which is the cork tile and a simple polyurethane finish on, on the tile itself. Heterogeneous cork is a direct glue down and it has a cork tile, a cork veneer and polyurethane finish. So it has layers. A floating floor with a click system, which would be similar to what we talked about with the LVT process or the rigid core that also have click systems available. It has cork backing, it has an intermediate layer and then cork tile and then a polyurethane finish. There are two main types of installation processes for cork flooring. The more traditional installation method usually used for cork flooring and tile form is adhesive connection. First, the flooring tiles need to be acclimated to the environment inside the installation room, similar to what we saw for other types of products and resilient flooring as well. Then the subfloor, such as concrete or plywood must be prepped to assure that it's even, clean, and free of moisture, as you've seen and heard this numerous times. This is an example of installation of cork underlayment that could be for acoustics, and then it could have another cork floor or tile put on top or another type of resilient flooring. So the goal is, is that you have a clean substrate, the tile adhesive is, has an application, and then it, the tile dries. Then the floor adhesive is applied, and the floor dries. And then once the floor is dried, you put the tile down for installation. Tile corners are pressed down and then they're, they're use a tile mallet to basically complete the installation. So what are the advantages of cork tile? It's a natural material harvested without harming trees. Trees improve with age actually. Acoustic insulator, it's a good thermal insulator, promotes underfoot comfort, it's fire stain, mold, and mildew resistant, rapidly renewable, and it has post-industrial recycle content. The last resilient flooring that we're gonna discuss is linoleum. So limestone calcium carbonate is the filler that is mined and can also be from the recycled side that comes into creating the filler piece. Fillers are added to linoleum cement, wood cork flour, pigments, stabilizers, to then have a, a flooring uh, process that's made in terms of compounding and curing. And then the wear layer is added to it as a lacquer, and then that creates your flooring. We've also seen linoleum used as countertops. So here are the different components. 3% are the colored pigments, 20% is the wood flower, 2% is cork um, in terms of the cork flower that's used. Resin is 5% and the linseed oil is 41%. So the majority of the product is made from linseed oil and wood flour. And then limestone, which is calcium carbonate, is the filler. The backing is generally made out of jute. There are two performance standards utilized for linoleum tile and sheet. For linoleum floor tile, it's ASTM F2195. And for linoleum sheet, it's F2034. Linoleum is produced in several stages. Oxidation of the linseed oil mixed with, with towel oil and rosin with the influence of oxygen from the atmosphere, a sticky tough material is obtained called linoleum cement. That's what you see in terms of the oxidation and the oxygen that is then added to the linseed oil, the rosin and the drying agent within the diagram shown. 
Linoleum cement is stored in containers for a few days to further the reaction. And after this, it is mixed with the wood flour, the calcium carbonate or limestone, the reused waste, if applicable, titanium dioxide and pigments. This mixture is calendared onto jute substrate and dried into drying rooms until cured to the required hardness. After approximately 14 days, the material is taken out from the drying room to the trimming department where the factory finish is applied on the surface of the product and the end inspection is completed. Lastly, edges are trimmed and the sheet is cut to length into rolls of approximately 32 meters. Trimmings and the rejected product are reused. As you can see, it comes back in the recycling process from the scraps back into linoleum powder and back through the process again. Linoleum sheet and tile, uh, the construction of it has a surface treatment, the solid linoleum and the jute backing. Linoleum installation does in some cases require more knowledge and advanced skills in installation. The material has a propensity to expand in the width and shrink in the length when rehydrated and adhesive. There are techniques that mitigate that movement. There is also the possibility of end curl memory. Due to drying the material and rolling it in its packaging, the ends of the, each cut must be worked out prior to installation so as to quote, break the memory and allow the material to lie flat. So when we go back to our conversation about installation and qualifying our subcontractors, this would be something you'd wanna verify that they had familiarity with to make sure your linoleum installation is done accurately and successfully. Advantages to using linoleum include bio-based raw materials, it's rapidly renewable ingredients, it has a through pattern material, and like other sheet product, it is also can be heat welded and integral cove based created. There are other polymers that are available that are also be using, used in resilient flooring. This is an example of polyurethane sheet flooring. Bio-based additives, bio-based fillers, alternative polymers such as TPO and PET are being evaluated and being utilized for flooring. There are performance standards for polyester composition floor tile and polyolefin composition floor tile as indicated here in terms of ASTM standard 2982 and 3009. There's an opportunity for rubber and cork or vinyl and cork composites uh, to be completed and it's a growing market within the resilient flooring industry. Many composites also use bio-based components or fillers. Product characteristics for vinyl and cork, cork could include bio-based plasticizers, Cork is a rapidly renewable product, still be flexible for coving bays and withstand high roller traffic. Similarly, product characteristics for rubber and cork are similar with no plasticizers and high slip resistance with the combination of cork and rubber anticipated in areas where moisture is present. This is an example of rubber and cork composite. And I, I think from a, a truly beautiful floor uh, that's created from the opportunity of, of mixing both rubber and cork together to create a composite floor with all the performance characteristics that come from both products. This is another way of thinking about composites. This is a sheet vinyl product, but it has a fiberglass stabilization layer and acoustic cushion layer. Therefore, it could be a composite in the sense that it also addresses multiple performance issues and performance characteristics that might be desired by the owner in the project. I wanna thank you for your time today. And if you have any questions, please direct them to my, myself and my email that's here. Uh, I am also the technical advisor to Resilient Floor Covering Institute, RFCI, and my contact information is jane at jsrassociates.net. Thank you for your time and have a good day.